this is going to be a different kind of presentation than you usually have because I'm not focusing so much on the science. I'm not focusing on the geology. I'm focusing on the beauty of natural minerals and especially natural minerals that are too, so too small to see with the naked eye. Just a basic of what a mineral is. A mineral has to have three different properties. It has to have a uniform uh, element or compound. It's all the same thing. It has to have a crystal structure that goes through the whole thing. And it has to form from natural geological processes, not biology. In other words, if it's man-made, it's not a mineral. Now, there are currently 5,779 minerals that have been approved by the International Mineralogical Association. Uh, and there's more every, every week. Uh, that was as of last night when I looked it up. <laughs> I have 125 to show you today, including this silver. But why do I take pictures of minerals? The idea for me is to share this beauty and the variety with people who don't get to see it on a, in, a, in their normal lives. I also just really like the aesthetic enjoyment of it, to be able to, to see it as art. Sometimes I, I like to look at, at these under the microscope and take a picture because it's, it's uh, much easier to see what I've actually got. Uh, many times, in fact, I have, have taken a photo so that I can get it close enough to really see what the terminations are like on a crystal. And it's, it's nice to be able to document these minerals that I've collected uh, and where they came from for science. And to do that, I like to take a picture. This is a native silver from Mexico. And on each of these photos, I actually back up a little bit here. I'm going to organize these by chemistry. Um, if you're not a, a chemist or not, don't know a lot about chemistry or anything about chemistry, don't worry, it's not essential. It's just the way I organized it and the way I think about them. But so we're gonna start with native elements. And other than that silver, I have two to show you. One thing that you'll notice is that on each of these slides, I've got the name of the mineral, the chemical uh, formula, where it was from, and the field of view, how, how big the, the photo is. That way you have all of the information in one place. But if you have questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask That's Perfectly. So, so that entire square photo was 1.34 millimeters more than- That's right. Yeah, the, the photo frame is that size. I really like this particular copper crystal because of the it's it's a twinned crystal, so it has three entrant angles in it, and it, it just has this look of a an Egyptian uh, artifact or something. Now, gold, of course, we're all familiar with, but. How many of us have seen a crystal of it? This is very tiny. It's about one and a half millimeter crystal. Uh, but I've never seen one with these cross hatched patterns within a hopper crystal like that. I just thought that was pretty spectacular. <laughs> All right. Sulfides and sulfur salts, it's probably what most geologists think of as ore. Um, these are oftentimes ugly black minerals like this born at night, but the structure of it is so interesting. And I think it makes kind of a nice little sculpture. Oh. And that's a big one for my collection. That's 2.7 centimeters. Oh. Galkaite is, is a really rare uh, mineral and it has a real uh, complicated chemistry to it, including cesium, thallium, mercury, copper, zinc, arsenic, and ammonium sulfur. And anyway, it's a beautiful red color cube. And this particular one is, is in a matrix of, of the uh, zeolite stilbite, which are these little 
uh, colorless crystals came from the Gershaw mine in, in uh, Nevada. Hmm. Wow. As did this Realgar. Realgar is a, a pretty common uh, arsenic sulfide. If you read the chemistry, oh. it's very difficult to make out the blue in the. Oh, I'm sorry. Background. Yeah, it's, it's arsenic sulfide. Oxides and hydroxides are usually grouped together. Cuprite is a copper oxide, and it's this beautiful red color with little. Not on the bike. I'm sorry? Not on the bike. I know, you took it away. Oh. <laughs> I'll try to, to speak louder. But this one occurred in a, in a mine that has uh, turquoise crystals as well. And they are. Um, particularly colorful, <laughs> oh. 2.5 millimeters across that one. There's another form of cuprite, same mineral, but a completely different form. You've got these little uh, elongated needle-shaped crystals, along with some little uh, uh, octahedrons on the right. Earthite is it often forms these little iridescent uh, uh, assemblages. They're not, I don't know, you can really call them crystals because they're they're botryoidal and you don't have any crystal crystal faces on them, but they it is crystalline within. I just think that it, there's some kind of a, a coating on here that has a an interference pattern that gives us these different colors. Now this is a, a this photo is also one of those examples of something where I needed to take a picture to be able to see something tiny. And that something tiny are these little tiny white hexagonal crystals at the bottom. Those are a, a, a phosphate mineral. I believe it's perhamite. Here's the first one tonight from Oregon. This was down from Summit Rock, which is just north of the, the uh, Crater Lake uh, boundary, which is why I can collect there. And um, it's a, magne a magnetite octahedron, but it's got epitaxial growth of hematite uh, growing along the crystal uh, structure. And I just think that's, that just fascinates me how this can how this can happen and what it's showing us about the crystal structure within that. There's also a little uh, a little crystal of enstatite down here, but uh, that didn't make the list that I wrote there. So, oh well. Mm -hmm. There's a pseudo brookite from Utah. Now this this came in a uh, in a topaz specimen that I oh. bought. But I looked down in a little crack in the in the matrix, and I could see this sort of brookite crystal, <laughs> and it was begging me to break the rock open <laughs> and risk the uh, topaz. And it did indeed uh, break the uh, topaz, which has a perfect cleavage. So uh, I think I came out better for it. <laughs> Any legs are the the uh, class of. Uh, of minerals which have chlorine, fluorine, bromine, yeah. and oftentimes other very complicated chemistry like this one. Malayite usually forms cubes, but this one has oct octahedral faces as well from Mexico. This is a fairly good size. This is a 1.3 centimeter field. Oh. The, the crystal is about a half a centimeter. This is also Bolaite, a more typical cube, but it has these little plateaus on it, which are pseudo Bolaite, which grows epitaxially on the, on the cube to form these weird shaped cubes with bumps. Bartolakite, 
was originally discovered in the Bonalac mine. <laughs> Chlorogerite is probably the most common and the best well known of the halides, other than salt. Um, yeah, it's silver chloride. And it acts exactly like you would think silver chloride does if you were ever a photographer with black and white film. The chemical reaction there is silver chloride. And if you expose it to light, it pretty rapidly gets a dull sheen to it. But it also, if you leave it out in the sun for more than a day, it'll turn black. So I had to take that picture and then put it in a, I wrap them in foil. Diabolaite is kind of related to the other boleites, but less common. Yeah. And hydroxide. This one is, is pretty rare too. This is the first uh, photo that I had actually published in, in two separate uh, research uh, papers for uh, in theses by grad students. Herbert Smith I, is, is particularly interesting to minerals. Uh, students because it has some weird kind of quantum mechanical effect going on within the structure. Uh, and I got the, the uh, papers that these guys wrote and they're way over my head as far as the quantum mechanics is concerned. Um, but just knowing that it has something to do with quantum makes these extremely valuable on the, uh, the uh, Crystal healing uh, market for people who think that minerals will heal them. Anything that that is written up about that says quantum <laughs> is like ten times the price. <laughs> so it's hard to find them anymore. Even if even if people collected them, they all got far up to heal. Who knows what? Uh, amine I has, besides the chlorine, it has an amine group in, this, in the structure. Uh, and it's one of only four minerals that do. Uh, with that ammonia in it, it's, um, it's hard to keep these from evaporating. So I have to keep these wrapped up too. Yeah. Right. Carbonates, nitrates, borates, these are all very similar, but we were talking at dinner about, about um, azurite. And sometimes for me, it's not just about the single crystal, but about the, the texture and, the, and how, it, uh, how it fits with everything else that's going on. The azurite, of course, is the deep blue uh, with this rough texture. And then these, these uh, balls of very fine texture are the malachite here. And, Azure and malachite almost always starts out as azurite and is pseudomorph to malachite uh, because that's a lower energy state of pretty much the same chemistry. I've got a bunch of azurite in here because I think it's really interesting. In this particular case, I was taking the picture of the calcal alamite, which is the light blue assemblages in the middle, but it was surrounded by these, these crystals of azurite. And I got looking at them and said, you know what, they, they've got dishes in them. I wonder why. Um, so I looked closer and I discovered that all of these little dishes have little black crystals in them. <laughs> and they are the, uh, Azurite was being dissolved away and forming little cuprite crystals. So I thought that was pretty neat. So I got even closer and there's a half millimeter field of view there and you can see these tiny little ones. They must be about 20 micron crystals of cuprite. Right?
There's another, another example from the same specimen, a jumble of cuprae. Right, Callahanite is, has some magnesium in it as well as the carbonate. Um, and it only occurs in a couple of places on the planet, including this Sierra magnesite to mine in, in Nevada. The white is, is magnesite. Dacris, Dacrispignite uh, is, contains a, a rare earth element as well as the copper and the carbon and chlorine. It only occurs in, in Australia. One Godoy one Godoyite and calconatronite. The uh, calconatronite is the clear little crystal, little bluish crystal on the lower left, and the one Godoyite are the purplish blue uh, crystals in the rest of the field. Uh, they are pseudomorphed after the uh, calconatronite. That was the first state, and then it, it oxidized or something into the other form. Rosasites, a common zinc copper carbonate. This one happens to have some chlorargyrite crystals growing on it. Um, here's another one of those amines, which is the uh, shilovite. And those are purple, uh, which are within the other uh, material here. The light blue is the Aminite that we saw a few slides back, but then there's this huge, huge terite, which are these little needles. This is pretty rare stuff, and even when it does come out, it just it disintegrates pretty quickly if you don't keep it sealed. Henry light only occurs in one mine in, um, in Japan. So I was lucky to get this piece. And the, I, I swear the IMA really dropped the ball on this one when they accepted the name Santa Rosa. I, 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 I should have I should have been there to tell them it's really blueberry. I, but <laughs> they didn't ask me. It's a borate. Okay. Sulfates, chromates, selenates, and tellurates. These, these can be all kinds of fun. A lot of variety in here. Uh, antlerite, uh, I, I like this one for a number of reasons. It's the only antlerite I have, but also the name of the mine, the broken toe mine. When I was there, I was just so conscious of my safety <laughs> because I didn't want to be broken toe number two, but somebody was. You know, they somebody was. Um, how many of these did you collect at the site, and how many did you have to buy? Roughly? Probably half and half. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's if it's in California, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, Utah, I probably collected it myself, um, including this one, this proton type from uh, Silver Coin Mine. I like this one because it shows you that the crystals are lined up or almost twinned in this cyclic uh, shape, which is unusual for brochentite. This is a more common form for brochentite. I, I like that one. It's one of my most popular crystal, popular photos. Exactly. I used it for Christmas cards. Oh. Yeah, that's cool. Gypsum is not always always so clear cut in the crystal faces, and this one's been etched away a bit to form a. Well, you know what it looks like. Okay, looks like a whale to me. Uh, like a sperm whale. I just think that's pretty neat. 
And Caledonite is another sulfate, um, which uh, I'll show you some more at the, at the end, but uh, it's just got such a beautiful color. I can't get enough Caledonite. Calcanthite is usually a post-mining mineral. It, it, will, it will occur when there's acidic solutions which leach the uh, sulfur out of solution and combine with copper. So you, you get the classic copper sulfate blue that you would see in chemistry class. Um, but it, it will line the uh, walls of mine shafts. And things. And that's where I found this one. And you can even see the source of the copper with these little pyrite crystals at the bottom, which are kind of etching away, and the gypsum, which is etching away to form calcanthite. Now, the calcoalamide is, the, again, the white, blebby looking stuff in the middle, or, or almost white. It's kind of, the projector is kind of making it a dimmer blue than it is, but, but I love the, the patterns here. This is what I'm talking about when I'm saying making art from, from minerals. Uh, I mean, the art's already there, but I'm, I'm trying to capture it in a way that makes it obvious that that's art. And these are azurite. Uh, little crystals, but they're surrounding these spherules, which are kind of zoned and layered. That's a fairly large one too. That's 2.1 centimeters across there. Crystallite. It's a very rare sulfate mineral, of copper and zinc. And it's the blue. Conellite. I was in I was in this mine uh, last summer, but the, the edit where it had been found, the 150 level had been concreted over so that I couldn't get in. And, and I couldn't hurt myself, yes, but I couldn't find any conellite either. So I had to buy this one. Um, but I love that. It's blue. <laughs> Sanitrishite is, is a fuzzy mineral, a fuzzy blue mineral. And so I took a close up of it. That's 1.7 millimeters with little tiny terminations on the crystals. Carbonate cyanotrichite is closely related, but it has a, a, a carbonate as well as a sulfate in the structure. Jarosite, as geologists, you may know jarosite. It's, it's, it's a, a precursor for many different uh, uh, chemical reactions and, and, and mineral reactions. And it's, um, it's one of the things that they found on Mars, which is leading the Martian mineralogists to have all kinds of things to, uh, to study. This one was from the uh, silver coin mine and that's three quarters of a millimeter across the field. The, the red is hematite staining this quartz. Johannite is the first uranium mineral that I'll show tonight. Again, a pretty neat color, very striking um, under the microscope. It's a little washed out here, but uh, Blue Lizard Mine is a great, I, I like mine names. Sometimes they're really creative like that. Apparently that mine is so radioactive that you have to suit up in an Intel bunny suit type of thing to go in it with air supply and everything. So I have not been in there. Um, I have my limits. Tennisite is the, uh, the blue. Right. Mm -hmm. And Langeik, yeah. 
these are all twin. You can see the how the 60 degree angles repeat themselves all over in here between the different crystals right here. I mean, 30 degree angles and here and here and here. I guess I did that one. Yeah. And the, those are all places where the, the crystals are growing together in a twin. And what that means is that the, the, um, the structure, the, the lattice planes of the, uh, of the mineral can find a way to hook in together so that they, so that it still works and they become one. It's not two separate crystals, it's one. It's just that they gr can grow out in two directions at once and still maintain that, that lattice. Linerite is another fairly common uh, copper mineral containing lead and sulfate. <laughs> Go ahead and pronounce that one. It's posniaki, um, which is much harder than the chemistry. It took me a long time to learn how to say that. Very interesting little, little arrowhead shaped crystals. It's one of the smaller ones that I've got to show, point, point 0.56 millimeters. So the black is a contaminant? Well, I, I don't know that I call it a contaminant. It's another mineral, and I don't know what it is. It's, I can't get closer than this to really be able to see those crystals well. Very. Yeah. But is the post actually flat? I mean, yes. Yeah, they're they're flat um, in in that dimension, and then <laughs> and then kind of arrowhead shaped in the other two. So yeah. Is it growing parallel sheets? I don't know. I don't know. It kind of looks like that, doesn't it? With this reentrant angle here. Circularite. Now sometimes with these, it's not just the, the main crystals that I'm looking at, it's the background. And that's part of the making art out of it is that I want a, a whole scene. That's why I called this the micro mineral landscapes because I want a whole scene, not just pluck that tree out and stick it in front of you. I think it makes for it makes for better science, but it also makes for a better uh, art. Oh yeah. One of these is orthosurpurite. One is surpurite, which we just saw. And there's a little bit of hemimorphite, which are these crystals up here. I've got a better hemimorphite for you later. Oh, yeah, spangolite. This is one of my favorites. Um, I almost died in this mine last summer, uh, but uh, it's, it's dangerous going into those, but uh, these are so very, very lustrous and blue that it just really, really appeals to me. I don't know what it is about blue minerals, but they just seem so electric. Well, Paul Adams, I, I've met Paul Adams, and this is his mineral. I believe he collected this himself. The bluish stuff up here is more of that calcanthite that occurred in the mine after, after mining. Housley, I've met Bob Housley as well. The tellurates, we're starting the tellurates now, and they are. Uh, a bunch of them were discovered in this mine, Otto Mountain, over the past 20 years. And most of the people who were in the team who, who have been mining have been honored with having one of them named for them, including Bob Houseley. Um, 
Kenite is a more common and older known tellurium mineral, lead copper tellurate. I don't know what the yellow is. Maybe that's Bruce Tellurate. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, the, the green is again that kenite, but this yellow is thornite, named after Brent Thorne. Wow. There's more tellurates here. This is Quetzal Colotolite, is the blue, which, how can you not love a mineral named Quetzal Colotolite? <laughs> um, but it's blue too, so this one really wins my heart. And the lysengite is the yellow, and they're little hexagonal crystals of yellow. I don't know what the white is, but yeah, it's from the North Star Mine in, in Utah. And Tim Roseite, I've got Tim as well, again from Auto Mountain. And this is probably house the eye here. Now I'm gonna take a break from the minerals here and just because everybody always wants to know, well, how do you take all these pictures? So I've got a little section about that here. Okay. Physics, yeah, it's, it's a pain. When you're trying to take pictures of things that are really tiny, it's very challenging. Uh, if, you, if you're taking a picture of a person standing in front of you, yeah, the camera can get it all, all of their face in focus. But the higher you magnify, the shallower the depth of field is to the point where if you're magnifying the kind of things that I'm showing in here, where it's just a couple of millimeters across the field of view, you go, I'm going 10. 10 times or 20 times magnification onto the sensor of my camera, you lose all the depth of field. And so yeah, it's, the smaller the, you can try stopping it down, but the more you stop it down, uh, you lose uh, sharpness because of uh, diffraction around, around the edges there. So, it becomes a real problem when you get this kind of magnification. <clears throat> You'd like to be able to see everything in focus, but like here, you've got this inside crystal at the top that's in focus, it's some of the UVI, but not most of it. And it just is unsatisfying. Now you can kind of, there, one thing you can do is to try and arrange the specimen so that everything that you care about being in focus is you know lined up at the right angle and it's it's very limited <laughs> that almost worked here with this torbernite sure didn't work with this mimetite <laughs> um yeah depth of field i really hey stop that it keeps on over advancing sorry uh it, i would want 250 microns as depth of field but my Sensor only does five. Okay, stop it. I'm not sure why it is doing this, but the focus stacking, there's a sharp part and a not sharp part. Okay, well, how about if we take 50 shots and let software figure out what's sharp? Voila. There is specific, there's specialized software that does that. Um, and I use that. Okay. Uh, this is driving me nuts. It keeps advancing. I don't like that. Somehow it got on automatic and it's. You animated the slide? I may have. I don't remember doing that, but there we go. That's, that's what it was supposed to look like. Yeah. yeah. This is. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. Let's wait for a minute until I'm done with this section. There we go. Okay, so you can see sort of the uh, 
the elements of my optical setup here. I've got a, a camera body and a telephoto lens and a, a, a long working distance microscope objective and the specimen and some robot gadgets down at the bottom, <laughs> which um, make the uh, which automate the process of taking a photo and moving the camera and taking a photo and moving the camera. Because I am patient, but I am not patient enough to do 250 of these with a turn of five microns every time. What do you have for a backdrop? It varies. Um, in the case of the, mic the microscopic ones, I don't really worry about that because I'm not going around the edges for the most part. If I'm doing something a little bigger, I'll choose between white uh, backdrop that I illuminate uh, or a black backdrop, just depending on the specimen. Okay. I don't like colored ones and I see them in some photos and it doesn't, yeah. doesn't satisfy me. Is all your illumination um, natural light spectrum or do you use ultraviolet or Red or that's that's a good question and it's um most of the time i am using flash attachments from for, for my uh micro stuff all of the the micro stuff with the uh with the um, objective here those are all illuminated with a flash sometimes the bigger specimens i'll use leds for lighting um sometimes i'll use sunlight if it's excuse me, if it's available. Uh, but if there's something that needs UV illumination, I've used it. I don't include any in this presentation, but there's a few things that, especially from Washington Pass, that uh, are much easier to see if you fluoresce them. So I've done it. It's hard when you're doing this kind of magnification to get enough UV in there to that spot to, to do it. <laughs> Most of the, the lamps are built with the idea of being a wide thing and you can't just put a lens on them because the lens, the glass won't transmit it. So, all right, there's the guts of my robot. And this is how I'm working it now. It's um, vertical now uh, because I have less problem with the thing drooping and the specimens stay put when they're sitting on something. What's the camera itself? Uh, does it have to be a tiny specialty camera the ordinary not life? Or... In my case, yes, because that's what I have. Um, I know other people who are using mid range SLRs to do the same thing. I liked that I could, could plug in uh, a shutter control of my own design without having to hack theirs uh, because it's a professional level camera. It's got all of these capabilities to be run off of a power source and things like that. Uh, but that's not really necessary. There are other, many people who are doing it with lesser camera bodies than this Nikon D3. All right, back to the minerals and we're going to go f5 no 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 80 enter. 80? 80 enter. nope too much. Too much. there it is thank you how'd you know that okay all right, so back to the minerals, phosphates, arsenates, vanadates, and molybdates. This is a long section, so I did that other thing before it. Libethanide is a copper phosphate, which occurs in a bunch of different forms. This is probably the most common one, but this is the one that I self-collected. And this one, and I think they, you know, growing up in Oregon, I think this looks like moss. And if I had found that in a rock or, or growing on a rock, I would have thought that it was, it was moss, not a mineral, but I broke this rock open fresh. <laughs> it's not, not moss. 
in the Solonite only occurs in a couple of places on the planet. Very lucky to find one. Pyromorphine are these white elongated crystals, which is a lead phosphate with chlorine. I think the blue is not, this, these are really green. The color is a little off on the screen, but the, uh, I think that's malachite. Now, samplite kind of gets close to the, that no biology rule a little bit because it only forms in environments that are enriched in bat guano. Oh, yeah. oh, the it's not the direct result, but it, that's one of the elements that has to be there. So it's kind of a little. Little little push. I love I love how these are just little little plates and they're just lined up in these rosettes like that. Carbonite we saw before. This you know I use that as an example, of course, of that of the one one dimensional way of, of setting your uh, your shot up, but. If I were to do this one again, I would stack it and get more of it in focus. Now, torbernite naturally uh, uh, decays into metatorbernite. The uranium in torbernite does something to it and it encourages more water to get into it somehow. Sunebite are these green crystals up here, and the nematite are the yellow ones. Yeah. Turquoise. I like this, how the triangles line up up here of uh, turquoise crystals. But then you've got this ball shaped assemblage of fluorapatite crystals down here. And that does for us. This one, yeah. Again, turquoise, these blue crystals are turquoise crystals. And this, the yellow are chlorage, right? Silver chloride, right? So now imagine the Native American silver and turquoise jewelry that we've all seen, and you're looking at mineral form of that. I think this is more beautiful yet. The cellulite are the blue crystals, and the hemimorphite is actually colorless, but there's so much blue bouncing around in this shot that it's reflecting off of the hemimorphite and making it look blue too. Another Vesalii. A pair of oxide are these white uh, crystals, and then the blue, deep blue, are uh, our regular voxite. These were both discovered at this mine. Gardite is a a rare earth um, copper arsenate. And there are various forms of it with different rare earth elements. Arthurite. We're in arsenates now. Arsenates are fascinating because of the huge variety of colors that they show. I think that's the most complicated chemical right. formula. Barahonite. <laughs> yeah, carminite.
alkylphilite. This one really shows its, its crystal structure really well. It's got an alternating bevel on the, on the edges of that crystal. And you can see it so clearly here. And then it's got this little uh, cornubite sitting on top of it, which is a botryoidal copper arsenate. One of my friends told me it looked like a Buddha sitting on a lily pad. <laughs> so now I have to say that every time. Clinoclase is my favorite blue mineral, especially since I collected it. It was good fun. Now you can't have a mineral talk without fluorite, but I'm going to cover it up with conocalcite. And you can see the thin layer of conocalcite surrounding these fluorite cubes and everything else in the picture. If you're familiar with quartz very much, you know that it, it forms twins very rarely, but it will form what they call Japan law twins. And that's what we've got here. It's quartz that's got girthite coating on it, but it's growing in a twin. And it's coated on top of that with coney calcite. When I uh, collected this and discovered that this vug that's about two centimeters across had 17 of these Japan law twins in it. Cornwallite. <laughs> yeah, like I say, lots of variety in the color. Erythrite is, is always a pink or, or purple, and all of these pink and purple things in here are all erythrite. They're just different forms and different generations of formation. Uh, it's, a, it's a common secondary mineral with, uh, with cobalt occurrences. And uh, and, and boys there, it's particularly beautiful. On the site. And this one's a little hard to see, huh? it, but these little square shaped yeah. flat crystals and they're stacked up kind of offset a little bit. Um, those are the uh, Winitaite. I went to the type locality for this, went to the boulder where it had been found this summer and was looking for some, couldn't find any. Lagrandite, not named after Lagrand, Oregon. <laughs> First found at this mine in, in Mexico. Now, Lamerite is the green. And the Lamanskyite are these blue um, triangle shaped crystals, sharp, almost tooth shaped crystals there. It looks like a fuzzy blue caterpillar in there. Lavendulin, hard to capture the crystal faces, it's just too lustrous. The raconite are the blue crystals, and they're uh, it's it's one of those you know every every uh, collector has a holy grail, and for mineral collectors, the raconite is probably it because all of it that has ever been found is all there is, and the last time any was found was a hundred years ago. Um, and it's all all come from this area of Cornwall, England. So none has been discovered in a very long time. And I was lucky enough to get one. And it didn't make me mortgage my house. The, uh, the little crystals in the background, these kind of gray green crystals, those, those are an ugly form of all of a night. And we'll fix that in a minute. There's a little tiny mimetite cluster. <laughs> Mm 
more mimetite, different forms. Of course, this crystal is mimetite, but so are these little, little uh, triangular ones. And I, I keep questioning that and people who, who uh, have owned the mine had it tested and yes, they are both mimetite. So I don't know how mimetite forms in those two such different shapes, but there you go. This is also mimetite on, on some chrysocolla. Chrysocolla is one of those minerals that I love to hate um, because it it often will will replace other minerals that I would have rather had, but it makes such a beautiful backdrop. <laughs> Things like this that I can't hate it too much. Yeah. All right, all of the night. And all of the night. Yeah, I, I collected that one. I, I left it in, in the wrapping for probably five years before I opened it up to see what it was. Okay, this one's worth keeping. He's thrashing your eye. Uh, Rickles glorified, yeah. My favorite antimony mineral, even if it only has one atom of antimony in the, in the molecular structure, it's still a, such a beautiful thing. I went to this mine in uh, Nevada uh, about six or seven years ago, hoping to collect some. And again, I got there and it's near enough to Reno that the University of Las Vegas, I mean, the University of Reno Nevada Reno uh, mining uh, mine tech uh, class uses it as a, a uh, teaching class. It's, it's an abandoned mine. They don't aren't mining it for the last hundred years, but they're using it as a uh, a teaching class project. And they had that thing so full of concrete. And there must have been five years worth of students going in doing their uh, mine safety remediation. Oh well. Old oh, Wilson. All right. So the zalocyte are these little sprays of light blue crystals. The serpierite are these dark blue striated crystals. And I don't know what these are. These are probably chrysocolla replacing something I would have rather had. Zoinerite is another uranium mineral. The other uranium mineral, the torbernite, was a uranium phosphate. This one is a uranium arsenic. Huvanidates, this one. The best crystals I've ever seen in the Levite. Chuyamunite. <laughs> That's another tricky one to say. And of course, vanadium. This is a big, a big one. Two point eight. Uh, this is the size of the specimen. Two point eight by one point eight by one point five. And Volborthite. Okay. The lib dates, I only have one to show you. And of course, it's, it's Wolfenite. Uh, Nematite often occurs with these, giving some interest to it. There's that guy. Oh. All right, real rocks. Now we're going to talk about real rocks. Ahoy, uh only occurs, I think, in a couple of places on the planet, but it was discovered at New Cornelia uh, 30 years ago. That's when it was. This is Washington Pass. 
Uh, the, the dark black uh, crystal is our fencenite, uh, which is a, uh, all right, sorry. But then it's got uh, azurine growing on it epitaxially here. These are three silicate minerals in one, one shot. All three of them are type locality for this particular place. Uh, the apatchite is the blue. The green are the helite or helalite, and the orange are ruizite, um, all from the Christmas mine in Arizona. Boltwoodite is a, a uranium silicate. Probably uh, with some aracalcite in the background. Calcite is a type locality in Oregon, and this is this piece is actually from there. Unfortunately, by the time I was collecting minerals, it had been turned into a state park and had been mined out. So uh, there is no more down there. But and they, even if there was, you couldn't collect it. But I got this from an old collector. And when I picked it up out of the out of the box of little crumbs, it just happened to form this shape. And it was Valentine's Day, so I posted it on my Facebook. <laughs> little three millimeter heart there. Now, sometimes you can catch chrysocolla doing its dirty work in, in the act. And here it is replacing brochentite. You can see the ends are turning blue, turning into, into chrysocolla right in front of your eyes. Here's another Oregon uh, mineral, clinoptilolite from over at Oceanside. The boulders on the on the beach down to the low ocean side are full of this stuff. The locals don't much like it when you sit out there with that sledgehammer I discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Dioptase is um, copper silicate. And of course, garnets are a silicate, including this green grossular from Canada. You wanted hemimorphite. Here is your hemimorphite. So we've got, just to show that it's hemimorphite, we've got nice angle terminations. And we have nice flat terminations here and here. Thus leading to the name hemimorphite for hemimorphism. There's another flat one over here. Kinoite, this was first discovered here at the Christmas Mom. We've got a lot of tactical minerals there. And kiercetite is it's one of the amphibole supergroup. And they, over the past 10 years or so, they've been redefining the names of the minerals and redefining what, what that means as far as the, the uh, very complicated chemistry of amphiboles. Um, so I'm not sure if they would still call it that, but that's what it was labeled when I got it in trade. So I'm going to keep that name. This one is, um, is quite interesting because you've got this double terminated crystal here, which had to start growing in the middle. Yet it's not really anchored in the middle, it's anchored up here. But as it grew out, you can see the conditions changed and instead of being opaque, it suddenly went transparent or orange on the ends. So it was growing out from those in. Uh, it's interesting. But then this crystal up here oscillated between opaque and transparent. Opaque and transparent. Something very weird happened when these formed. So you can sometimes tell a story with a picture like this that 
it's hard to really get your head, your head around, you know? Kite night, also known as steam. Titanium silicate from Washington Pass with albite. Oh, here's here's your other type locality mineral from about 20 miles from here, Chernikite, not at Global. It's yep, the type locality is just a few hundred yards up near near road. They don't there's nothing there anymore, and they don't let you, and they don't let you collect, but um, that's where it was. Named after Rudy Chernick, who used to be the, the uh, curator over at Rice Museum and, and was one of the world's uh, foremost experts on zeolite minerals. Uh, well, I can't, you got to have quartz if it silicates, right? Mm -hmm. Some people classify this as an oxide, but I think that's so. Um, this came from out Tillamook County. Picked it up when I was a very young boy. Shatakite is another fuzzy blue mineral, but this one's a silicate. And string hamite, that's the blue mineral here. The zonotite are these hairy looking uh, white crystals. And I told you I'd come back to caledonite, and this is my very favorite caledonite. So, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to answer questions or or of anybody. Yes. Uh, Little beetle crystals look really delicate. I wonder how they survive breaking the rock. Um, some of them don't. You see, the, this is sort of one of those things where you, what you see has been selected uh, for the ones that made it. Um, because I'm not taking pictures of the broken ones. It, you but may, you're right. You, you, may, you may want to repeat the questions. Okay. If the audience. Oh, they don't, home. they're not mine. Okay. Okay. The question was about the tiny little needle shaped crystals being very delicate. Yes. It's not basic. I've got a new kid on the block. All of these crystals form in some liquid under some conditions. Is that correct or not? Most. There are some that will form out of vapor. Okay, but there's some. Um, okay. And I don't know, I don't know that there are any that I showed like that, but I do know I have some it's in my different, different pressures and, and yeah. temperatures and, and chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a question from the chat. Okay. Uh, with this is from Wes. So with so many similar looking, say blue crystals, who identifies them? Okay. And there are probably 30 or more bluish ones you showed us. Mm -hmm. And how are the chemical compositions determined? Mass spectrometry and does it destroy the crystal when it's analyzed? Okay. That's a lot of questions in one. That's a lot of questions. Um, in this case, the locality is really key to knowing what you've got, knowing where it came from, and even down to the level of what part of the mine uh, is often very helpful to knowing which blue mineral you have, uh, knowing the associations or the other minerals that are found with it can be a real clue uh, because that tells you some of the chemistry that was happening in that, in that place. Um, can all, it also can rule things out if you find, you know, something that could not possibly have have formed in the same environment or survived in the same environment as this other thing that you think it is, then it's not that thing. Um, who decided what these were is, it goes back oftentimes to testing um, and the testing involves a whole bunch of different things over history. Uh, sometimes the tests were done with chemistry, sometimes 
they are so so characteristic of a species that you just know it's that. Malachite is pretty hard to mistake for anything else. Um, but you know, sometimes things are are very similar looking, and sometimes minerals don't look like their their archetype. So. In those cases, you have to go to more thorough testing with chemistry. Uh, they used to do, you know, testing of the angles of the terminations and things, and that would help define what the crystal structure is. Now they more often use X-ray diffraction, uh, but that's expensive. And like you say, in some cases, it destroys the specimen. There's also uh, a technique called Raman spectroscopy or they shine a laser on, on the specimen and, and look at how it uh, excites. It's kind of similar to fluorescence, but a little different. Uh, it's a quantum effect. Quantum effect. Um, <laughs> that, um, that can help to uh, distinguish minerals because each mineral has a distinct Raman pattern that it puts off. And those have been cataloged now. Uh, and that does not destroy the specimen, but you have to have access to the, to the tools and they're quite expensive. <laughs> so sometimes you can send them away and get them, get them analyzed for 30 or $40, which if you just have everyday specimens, it's expensive because these things aren't worth more than a quarter a piece or something, you know. <laughs> when they fit in a box like this, they're not, they're not uh, you know, museum pieces, but um, that's some of the things that I consider. In some cases, there's probably a few in here that the IDs are wrong. Um, let's see, but that my IDs are based on visual identification and knowing the chemistry of the site and looking at what other people have discovered um, it's all cataloged out on, on mindat.org, which is a, if you don't, not familiar with it, it's, it is the resource for minerals, mineral collectors, mineral professionals, they all use Mindat. Um, and it's a database that contains all of the, all of the sites that people have, have been willing to put in, and there are millions of, of sites on it. It includes lists of the minerals that have been found there, both in the literature and by collectors. It has photographs that people have taken. So a number of these photos are out there. Um, and gives a, a way for people to discuss whether that really is a caledonite, for example. If there's some question, there may be some discussion about that particular photo and people who know better will Say, so, yeah, yeah, I had one of those tested. It was in that same place. You're right. That's that's Lebethan, right? Not a piece of moss. And um, that kind of thing. Let's see, one more, and there was one more in that, which was how do they determine the chemical structure or the chemi chemistry of it? And that is through chemical methods and through um, um, through you know other other Animal, you know, scientific analysts. It's just a. It's a, it's above my ability to do that kind of work, but when a new mineral is described, all of that has to be done as part of the documentation for that new mineral, and that's there's half a dozen people in on the west coast who do that kind of work, uh, both professionally and and you know, on an amateur level and have the tools to do it. And sometimes the chemistry is discovered to be a little different and they update it in, in the IMA records and on MINDAT. That science moves on. Okay, in the back. Well, that brings up a question. Are new minerals being discovered and identified all the time? Uh-huh. Repeat yes. the question. Are, are new minerals being discovered all the time? And the answer is yes. Uh, last time I gave this uh, talk, uh, I let's see, what, did it, what was the number? It was um, six months ago I did the uh, talk similar to this. 
and the number of minerals was 17 less than it is today. So about 30 a year, somewhere in there. Any other questions? Oh. Oh. What do they look like in situ when, when you're, okay. you could be walking over the stuff and not have any idea what you're walking over. Indeed, I, I did bring a few pieces of rock that look like rocks instead of, you know, blown up that I can show you when we turn the lights back up and you can, I'll come up and look if you want. Also have a, a few that I've gotten out of including that little blue heart. <laughs> That's it. Question was, what do they look like as part of the rock in situ? So, so I brought a few rocks to show. I also brought some of my uh, greeting cards that are some of the pictures you saw tonight and I can sell at a nice price. <laughs> when you're field collecting, um, what tools do you use to, to recognize that you've got? Be the, question. I, the question is, what tools do I use when I'm field collecting? Um, and I, the implication is, how do you how do you see what what's going on in these little things? They're so tiny, and um, and I just pulled my loop out from under my shirt. I've got a jeweler's loop. It's 10x, and on my hard hat, I have a a light mounted so that it's just the right place to light up a specimen that I hold in front of my loop. It's, it's easier when it's daylight and you're outside. Oh, uh, yeah, and the crack camera, of course. Yes? What kind of binds are you going into? What, what's their principal economic value? What, what's the, okay. you understand what? Okay, so the question is, what kind of mines am I going in? What what was their their uh, commodity? How what are these mines that I've been in? And it's it's really varied. Um, you know, in particular, I like to go to mines where I am pretty sure I'm going to find. And and, and right up front, these are all abandoned mines. These are not active mines. These are nobody's doing any work in them. Um, they're your, your typical death trap out in the middle of the desert mines. <laughs> but um, the, the types that I'm looking at here, this particular one from the Rowley mine, it was a lead mine. Um, it's, not, it's not being mined for lead anymore. Lead hasn't got the same value it did back in World War II uh, as, as it did back then in the World Wars. Um, but the, um, but it's now become a patented specimen mine where people go and collect specimens There are pe people who own it go and collect specimens. I did not collect this one. The guy who collected this had permission from the mine owner to collect this one. I don't go to mines like that because I don't, I don't know that guy. Um, I've gone to mines that are abandoned and they're typically all of the metals that you can imagine, uh, copper, lead. Um, if you look at the chemistry of the, the minerals I find, you get a pretty good clue for what they were mining. Um, it's almost always related, copper, lead, um, zinc. Um, there were a few that had uranium in them, but they weren't really looking at, for uranium at those mines. They were looking for the zinc at the, at the Boltwoodite mine, for example. Um, what other, you know, any, anything that has, has metallic value is really what they're mostly looking for. And then, and then things with zeolites like the, uh, the Chernikite, that was just, uh, that was just for gravel. They were, they were picking up boulders out of it to use in construction. Yes. How do you assess the risk when you're going into an abandoned mine? How do I assess the risk in an old mine? I bring with me a friend who has mine safety training and who insists that I do things in a safe way. 
and we both look at the situation, look for things that are about ready to fall, uh, look for cracks that shouldn't be there, things piled up on the floor, winces that might be hidden. Um, and there's been a few times that we've gone to a mine we really wanted to go into, but we, we looked at it and said, no, not doing that. There was one that just gave both of us the creeps and we practically ran out of it. Um, on the other hand, I had a close call last summer doing something that I knew I shouldn't have because that rock was too pretty. And I got the rock, but I almost lost it all. So, so I, I hope I learned my lesson. Carrie um, on the chat now said a similar comment. So first she said, look like the post range were probably mineral material aggregate lines or zeolites. Yeah. And then she said, don't go underground. Good to hear he's going in with the mine safety person. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I certainly would not go in underground alone. That would be nuts. Okay. I did it. You guys had your had your live meeting again. <laughs> <laughs>